Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to our Harvest Thanksgiving service. If you're visiting with us, we give you a special welcome. Our meeting house looks different this year. We look different this year, but we still worship the same great God, and he has still been so, so good to us. So it's right that we come to give thanks to him. I pray we'll all sense his presence as we worship him together and as we listen to him speak to us through his word. A few announcements just to begin with. Thank you to everyone who has supplied flowers to decorate our meeting house and our hall, or who supplied food for our Via Wings appeal. A special word of thanks goes to those people who use their time and their talents to arrange these items so beautifully for us. All being well, our evening online Harvest Thanksgiving service will be available on the church Facebook page and YouTube from 6 p.m. The guest preacher of that service will be the Reverend Andy Downey. Andy is the minister of Castlewell and Leitrim Presbyterian Churches, and this is the, the benefit of an online service. I already know it's a great sermon, so I can wholeheartedly endorse you listening to Andy's sermon and the service in general. Then our harvest praise service will be in here in our meeting house on Wednesday. Notice Wednesday this year to fulfill the 72-hour quarantine. So that's Wednesday at 8 p.m. The guest preacher will be the Reverend Jamie McGuire from Jarrett's Pass and Kings Mills Presbyterian Churches. And our guest singers will be David and Ellen Whiteside. So please come back again on Wednesday evening to give thanks to God. Encourage your family and friends to come with you. Then if you'd be willing to deliver uh, some of the flowers after our harvest praise service has taken place, please speak to Elizabeth Adams or Frida Martin. Then God willing, our worship services will continue in our meeting house next Lord's Day at 11 a.m. And our devotion group resumes next Wednesday, or sorry, next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. in the church hall. And that's for all young people who are in secondary school, year eight, up to year 14. Please come along and enjoy the fellowship and the fun at devotion. Then our Connect small groups, uh, these are for the ladies of the congregation. Uh, they will resume on Tuesday the 20th of October at 8 p.m. in the church hall. Uh, the studies this year will focus on life in God's story. So ladies, come along for a chat and some discussion around a short Bible passage. And then if you haven't already done so, please place your offering in the boxes at the door uh, on your way out. When Satan tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread in the wilderness, Jesus replied, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We're gathered here today to thank God for supplying us with our daily bread as we have seen him meet all our physical needs throughout this year with all its challenges. But we must also recognize that only God can meet all our spiritual needs. God has done this through giving us his living word, Jesus, and he's told us about it in his written word, the Bible. We're going to praise God now for meeting our physical and spiritual needs using our opening hymn, We Plough the Fields and Scatter. So let us stand to praise God.
We'll continue to adore God as we come to him in prayer. As we focus on his perfect character, we'll acknowledge our sinful character and we'll thank God for assuring us that he forgives all who are truly repentant. So let us bow before God now with our prayer of adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. Great creator God, we humbly bow before you, recognizing your infinite wisdom and power. You perfectly designed the universe and everything in it. Then you created it from nothing simply by speaking. As we look around us in these autumn days, we see abundant evidence of your handiwork, and it causes us to praise you. God of mercy, we praise you for not abandoning the universe after you created it, especially when mankind rebelled against you. We bless you for continuing to sustain the universe and everything it contains. We particularly want to thank you for providing for all our physical needs throughout another year. Sovereign Lord, as we examine our lives, we realize that our spiritual needs are even greater than our physical needs. So we praise you for meeting all of these in Christ Jesus. We bless you that he came into the world so that we might really live through him. Thank you for Jesus' life of perfect obedience to your word and your will. We praise you for Jesus' steadfast love for your people, which took him to the cross to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We bless you that Jesus, who had no sin of his own, willingly took the sin of his people upon himself so that he could take the punishment that this sin deserved and we could be clothed in his righteousness by faith. Gracious God, we praise you for giving us the gift of eternal life the moment we believe exclusively in everything Jesus has done to meet our spiritual needs. So forgive us for continuing to sin against you despite all you've done for us, are doing for us, and will do for us. Today in particular, we ask you to forgive us for worshiping the things you've created rather than worshiping you, the great creator God. Forgive us for greedily seeking after earthly possessions and positions rather than earnestly seeking your kingdom. Forgive us for acting as though we were in control of our lives rather than submitting to your sovereign rule. Thank you for assuring us that the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin when we repent of it. Enable us to rely on your grace to obey and serve you every moment of every day. We bless you for supplying us with the power to enable us to do this through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Grant that our worship today and every day would be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' gracious name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're going to read verses 13 to 34. In this passage, Jesus tells a parable about a successful but foolish farmer to explain the consequences of greed. Jesus then goes on to describe the contentment that comes from godliness. So Luke chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 13. And this is God's word we're reading together. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. 
the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. That is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. And we know that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. One of the biggest drawbacks associated with the current COVID restrictions is that our choir aren't taking part in our harvest services this year. So I'm very grateful to Elizabeth and John for sorting out two pieces which the choir sang at our harvest services last year for us to listen to. They're entitled, He's Always Been Faithful and Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. God is always faithful to his promises and to his people because he indeed is Lord over all.
Our children are now going to tell us what they are thankful for this harvest. For our homegrown vegetables. I'm thankful for our farmers because they harvest all of our food. Thank you to the beautiful flowers. This harvest, we're thankful for our food. This harvest, I am thankful for. I am thankful for all the farmers and the dairy they provide. I am thankful for all the animals um, so that we can look after. I am thankful for the crops that the farmers provide. Thank you, Thank God. God! This harvest, I am thankful for the apples. This harvest, I am thankful for the food from the animals. This harvest, I am thankful for these carrots. This harvest. Farmers. This harvest, I am thankful for nature. This harvest, I am thankful for calves. Thank you, boys and girls, and thank you to your parents for recording what you want to thank God for. The boys and girls can now leave for Children's Church in the Minor Hall. And then Norman is going to come and lead us in our prayers of intercession. In our intercessions today, as well as our own country and church needs, we will also remember and pray for our church partners in India, and also Gary and Mary Reid, who were home in Northern Ireland for the summer, but have now returned to the mission in Kenya. So let's come before God's throne of grace for our prayers of intercession. Great Creator God, at this harvest time, we bring your world before you. Global pandemic, threat of economic chaos, tensions and rivalry between nations, we could easily be overwhelmed by it all. But sovereign God, we know that you are in control. And we ask that you would give wisdom to world leaders and that your Holy Spirit would replace fear with love and that your kingdom would continue to grow here on earth. Heavenly Father, we pray for all the church partners that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland have in India. We ask for your grace and mercy for the six million people currently infected with COVID-19 in India. We seek your wisdom and guidance for their leaders as they try to keep on top of the health and economic problems that face their people. We would also pray that a bill that is about to go before the Indian Parliament, making it illegal to convert to Christianity, would not pass, and that our Presbyterian Church in Ireland partners would have full freedom to share the gospel throughout India. Loving God, we remember Gary and Mary Reid, who have returned to Kenya after having had some time off here in the summer. We know that it was exceptionally difficult for them to part with their children again, and that they returned to the mission to find many things broken and issues that needed sorting. We give thanks that Gary was able to find some frayed wiring that had stopped the borehole working. So rather than paying nearly a thousand pound to having the company that installed the pumps come to the mission. We also ask for your continued grace, as much for the little things as for the big things in their daily lives in Kenya. We pray especially for the worship leaders course, alongside the family Bible synopsis taking place in the next few weeks. As we ask the Holy Spirit to speak through Gary as he teaches and preaches, and that the same Spirit would also work in the hearts of those who come to draw them to a closer and deeper relationship with Jesus. Closer to home, Lord, we bring our own country and its many needs to you. We ask for your hand upon our leaders 
as they try to find solution to so many problems. We pray for our Health Minister, Robin Swan. Give him and his advisers clarity of thought and sound judgment as they seek the best path, path through the many difficult issues our health service is facing. We pray for our Prime Minister and his representative, David Frost, as Brexit negotiations reach a conclusion. God of justice and righteousness, we ask that a trade deal could be found that would be both fair and agreeable to all. We would also pray for all the citizens of our country, that you would speak to our hearts in the midst of so much uncertainty. Help us to protect our minds by filling them with your word and not the lies of this world. God of compassion, we pray for those who are struggling with mental health issues brought on by a sense of loneliness and isolation. We know that Jesus was able to bring peace to the storm. And so, Lord, help us to bring our fears and anxieties to you, grateful in the knowledge that you care for us. Head of the Church, we seek your blessing on the work of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. We continue to remember our moderator as he represents our Church views in these challenging times. We also give thanks and ask for your continued blessing on our new Church plants throughout Ireland. We ask for wisdom and guidance for those in leadership of these churches and that you would continue to find ways for them to grow and reach out to the surrounding communities. Merciful Father, we think of those in our own congregation who are sick or in need of healing at this time, and we ask that you would draw close to them and that they would allow you to be their strength, that your love would drive out fear, and if it be your will, for them to be restored to full health. Loving Father, as we turn now to look at your word, we ask that we would experience the Holy Spirit moving in this place, that you would help us to understand and to put into practice what you say to us through Nigel this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Norman, for leading us in our prayers of intercession. Some of you will remember the BBC TV game show called Blankety Blank, where the contestants had to guess which word or words best fitted into the phrase they were given. If you were given the phrase, if only I had blank or blankety blank, I would be happy. What word or words would you use to fill that gap? Perhaps for some it might be, if only I had a bigger or better house, I would be happy. For others it might be, if only I had a bigger or better farm, I would be happy. For still others it might be, if only I had a bigger salary or better working conditions, I would be happy. For you young folks, it might be, if only I had finished with education or could drive or had a job or had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, I would be happy. For those who are a bit older, it might be, if only I had retired or I had better health, I would be happy. Sadly, for many in our society, it would be, if only I had a big lottery win, I would be happy. I imagine that currently many of us would say, if only the coronavirus was gone, I would be happy. But I wonder how many of us would fill the gap by saying, if only I had a greater desire for God's kingdom, I would be happy. Please open your Bibles again at Luke chapter 12 so that we can see what God is saying to us through this passage from his word today. Back in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we read that as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus knew that when he arrived in Jerusalem, he would be arrested and crucified. As Jesus and his disciples traveled south from Galilee to Jerusalem, 
crowds of people joined with them. In fact, by the time we get to verse 1 of Luke chapter 12, we read that a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another. In the first 12 verses of Luke chapter 12, Jesus warned his disciples about the hypocrisy of the Jewish religious leaders. And he instructed the disciples how to react when they were persecuted by these religious leaders. Luke then tells us in verse 13 that out of the blue, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. In our society, we're used with an inheritance being divided as equally as possible amongst all the children. If this doesn't happen, it usually causes tension among the family members. But in Deuteronomy chapter 21, Moses set out the principle for the Israelites that the elder son should receive double what the younger son received. The application of this principle or the failure to apply it also led to family disputes, which were normally settled by the rabbis or teachers. This explains why the man called Jesus teacher when he asked for Jesus' help. Jesus knows everything because he's God. He even knows the thoughts and the motives that lie behind us. So Jesus knew that this man's request was motivated by selfish materialism. Jesus replied in verse 14 by saying, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Jesus is the Lord of the entire universe. And he will return to earth one day to judge everyone who has ever lived. But when he came to earth the first time to fulfill God the Father's plan for the salvation of his people, he was careful not to become involved in matters that didn't directly relate to his work and ministry. This man's greed led Jesus to say to the whole crowd in verse 15, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We all need a certain amount of possessions to be able to live. But an abundance of possessions doesn't guarantee security, happiness, or contentment. In fact, the desire to have an abundance of possessions leads to foolishness, false confidence, and ultimately to discontentment. Jesus then continued to tell a parable about the consequences of greed. Like many of Jesus' parables, this one is very easy to picture. Jesus said in verses 16 to 18, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Notice that Jesus said this farmer was a rich man before his ground produced a good crop. This man was obviously a good farmer who had worked his land well over the years and God had blessed his work. Probably when things were going well, he improved his farm. And these improvements led to ever-increasing yields and profits. Jesus said that the farmer reached the stage where his ground produced such an abundant harvest that he had no place to store it. So he decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones to store everything God had blessed him with. In fact, he reckoned after this bumper harvest, he had now enough accumulated to enjoy a long, happy, and indulgent retirement. Jesus tells us in verse 19 that the farmer was going to say to himself, you have plenty of things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. After years of hard work, this farmer now planned to retire on what he considered to be the fruit of his labors. 
but God had a different plan. The night this man said to himself, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This man seemed to be wise when it came to running his farm. His success may have been admired or even envied by the neighboring farmers. But in God's eyes, this farmer was a fool. In verse 21, Jesus tells us why God called this man a fool and summarized the lesson he was teaching through this parable by saying, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. This farmer was a fool because throughout his lifetime, he was only interested in accumulating things for himself and pleasing himself. This farmer was a fool because he gave no serious thought to what God required of him or to seeking the gift of eternal life from God. Everything this farmer had worked so hard to accumulate was left behind for someone else to enjoy. And he didn't possess the only thing that he could have enjoyed forever which is God's gift of eternal life because he had never received it from God. When you think of it like this, it's easy to see why God called this man a fool. We all know people in all sorts of jobs whose sole aim it is to accumulate what they think will be enough to provide them with a long happy and indulgent life. But they give little or no thought to eternity, to God, to salvation, or to eternal life. Maybe that even describes someone here today. Please be clear. Jesus didn't teach this parable to forbid people from becoming wealthy nor does the rest of Scripture denounce wealth in itself. God nowhere condemns people for working hard and thereby prospering. Their problem wasn't the farmer's wealth. Their problem was his attitude towards his wealth. Jesus used this parable to clearly warn us of the danger of wealth seducing us towards complacency, self-sufficiency, and covetousness. Later in the New Testament, Paul told Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So how do we avoid the selfish greed that, this, that was this farmer's downfall? And how can we instead enjoy the godly contentment that Paul spoke to Timothy about? Well, Jesus followed up his parable about the foolish farmer by teaching his disciples how to avoid the covetousness that comes from greed. In verses 20 to 23, Jesus gives us three reasons why we shouldn't worry about accumulating even the most basic things in life, which are food to eat and clothes to wear. First of all, he says there in verse 23, life is more than food 
and the body more than clothes. There are many more important things in life than what we eat and what we wear. This is a lesson we all need to learn because we're constantly bombarded with advertisements from the food, drink, and fashion industries about what they think we should be eating, drinking, and wearing. The second reason Jesus gives us is in verse 24, and then in verses 27 and 28. God provides food for the birds he created, and we're much more valuable to God than the birds are. God also clothes the wild flowers and the grass of the field, which are here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. So Jesus assures us that God will take even more care to clothe us. God created human beings in his own image as the pinnacle of his creation. But God didn't just create this universe and everything in it and then abandon it. No, he sovereignly rules over every event and every person. And he's intimately involved in sustaining our life on an ongoing basis. We're met here today to thank God for his provision to us throughout another year in the harvest we've received. Jesus' third reason is there in verses 25 and 26, where he asks, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? None of us have enough control over our life to even add a single R to it. In fact, it's well known that worry causes health problems which reduces the length of our life. Instead of letting our concerns about food, clothes, and every other material possession lead us to greedily accumulate these things, we should trust God to lovingly provide us with enough of everything we need to live, and then wholeheartedly thank him for doing so. <clears throat> Jesus warns us in verse 30 that the pagan world runs after all such things as food, drink, and clothes, and your father knows that you need them. He goes on to say in verse 31, seek God's kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Today, one of the ways we see people most clearly running after earthly things to the neglect of seeking God's kingdom is by relaxing or working or pursuing their interests on the Lord's day rather than coming to worship God every week. Our society has reached the point where people think that they should be able to get whatever they want whenever they want. So many shops are open seven days a week and for more hours than ever before. This leads people to choose or to feel pressurized to work on Sunday. And people choosing to go to those places on a Sunday, which results in them not coming to church to seek God's kingdom. But it isn't just the retail industry that we see people prioritizing earthly things over God's kingdom. We see it in the hospitality industry with more people than ever going to cafes and restaurants on Sunday. We see it in the construction industry with building work being carried out on the Lord's day. We see it in the farming community with unnecessary work being done on Sunday. As well as people prioritizing material possessions over seeking God's kingdom on Sundays. It's also happening throughout the week as well. With people choosing to work ever increasing hours to get more and more things. And it's to the detriment of their marriage and their family. Both Jesus' parable about the foolish farmer and his teaching about how to enjoy contentment clearly shows that our greatest need is to be part of God's kingdom rather than to busy ourselves accumulating more earthly things. 
This is also one of the lessons that this crisis caused by the coronavirus continues to teach us. We become a member of God's kingdom when we humbly admit that we're a sinner who has offended an infinitely holy God by what we have thought, said, and done. This leads us to sincerely seek God's forgiveness by confessing these sins to God, believing that they'll be pardoned because of what Jesus accomplished for us through his life, death, and resurrection. When we become a member of God's kingdom through repentance and faith in Jesus, our desire from then on is to live to please God by obeying him in every area of our life. So we rely on the help of the Holy Spirit who lives within all God's people to be obedient to him. Jesus promised in verse 30 that if we seek God's kingdom, then he'll provide us with everything else we need. God always keeps his promises so we can trust him to do this. This means we never have to prioritize getting more material possessions over seeking God's kingdom because God will always provide enough for us. The rich farmer in Jesus' parable was foolish because he didn't trust in God. Instead, he trusted in his own efforts. So Jesus seemed to direct that parable to those who were unbelievers. But what Jesus said in verses 22 to 32 seems to be directed primarily to people who are believers. Because in verse 28, Jesus says, O oh, you of little faith, he didn't say, oh, you have no faith. And in verse 32, Jesus said, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. This reminds us that being obsessed about accumulating earthly things to the detriment of seeking God's kingdom isn't just something that unbelievers are guilty of. Even as believers, we can be carried along by the society we live on. Jesus concluded what he had to say about avoiding covetousness and instead experiencing the contentment of godliness by stating in verse 33 and 34, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus isn't instructing all of us to sell all we own and give the proceeds to the poor. However, he is telling us to generously share the blessings God has given to us with those in genuine need. Doing this doesn't earn us salvation, but if we're trusting Jesus to be our savior and to prepare a place for us in heaven, then we will seek to use the material possessions God has blessed us with for his glory, because we realize we'll leave all of these things behind when we die. Our attitude to the things of this world is a clear demonstration of what we value most. Our attitude to material possessions is a clear demonstration to whether we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbors as ourselves or whether we just love ourselves. Jesus taught his disciples in all ages to pray, give us this day our daily bread. But our society is an if only I had culture. It's what keeps advertisers in business. We're encouraged to think if only I had blank or blankety blank, far more than we're reminded to thank God for blank and blankety blank. So our prosperity can easily blind us to the blessings we already have. 
We're gathered here today to thank God for all his blessings to us throughout another year. Let's make sure we don't fail to embrace God's greatest blessing of all, which is seeking his kingdom and accepting his gift of salvation through faith in Jesus. Because when we have that, he will make sure we have everything else we need. And we can be confident that he will care for us whatever happens to us in this world. Let us pray and let's ask God to apply the lessons that we have learned from his word to each of our hearts as he sees that need. Loving Heavenly Father, grant each one of us a greater desire for your kingdom so that we worship you instead of worshiping the things you've created. Enable us to prize the free gift of salvation, which we receive through faith in Jesus, instead of greedily grasping after earthly possessions and positions. We praise you for the contentment that you guarantee to us when we do these things. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This first verse underlines what Jesus taught in the passage today. The verse will be repeated. The men will sing the words of the verse, and the ladies will sing, Allelu, Alleluia. Let us stand to praise God. Thank you.
amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the astounding love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Please remember to allow our meeting house to empty from the back. Thank you.